Welcome to the City of Newport Beach Central Library and this evening's celebration of the Joan Irving Brandt Centennial. Uh, this program this evening has been sponsored by the Newport Beach City Arts Commission and has been generously supported by the Newport Beach City Council. And we thank you for coming to join us this evening in support of the arts. The event this evening is a historical and cultural uh, perspective here in the city of Newport Beach. Joan Irving Brandt was a resident of the city of Newport Beach and a renowned artist. And you're here this evening to hear a perspective that is going to be offered by our distinguished speak speaker, Jennifer Martinez Wormser, and to learn more about Joan Irving Brandt and her life, her art, and her civic contributions here in the city of Newport Beach. So we thank you for joining us this evening. And before I turn this program over to Jennifer Martinez Wormser, I'd like to tell you more about Jennifer. Jennifer is the Laguna College of Art and Design Library Director, and she's also the archivist for the Brandt Collection. And everything that the family has uh, left behind, she's been in charge of and she's been sharing that with us over the last couple of years and earlier provided us a, I think it was the, a wash with color, Rex Brandt in here in this room about two years ago in November. So this evening she is going to share her perspective of Joan Irving Brandt and her life and her work. And uh, she's quite qual qualified to do that. She's been most recently provided with a, a very interesting award. It is the, um, the Society of California Archivist Sustained Service Award. So we're very proud of you, Jennifer, and give you a hand for that as well. So without further ado, I'd like to have you join me in welcoming Jennifer Martinez Wormser. Thank you, Arlene, for that lovely introduction. I'm going to move this over, because you'll see I have a fancy two computer technical arrangement this evening. So if you see me bopping back and forth, that's why. Um, I'm delighted to be here again. It, it was an honor to be invited to come speak at the library two years ago, and, and it was an extra special treat to get that email from Tim Heatherton saying, hey, do you want to come back? So that's a good sign. I did something right. So thank you again for inviting me and for including me in your, your celebration of, of Rex's uh, artistic life two years ago and Joan's artistic life this year. Uh, last Saturday would have been her 100th birthday, and I think we should celebrate it as much as we can. So I'm glad you're here to be a part of that journey. Let's see if I've got my clicker. Okay. So Joan Malik Irving was born in Riverside on March 12th, 1916. This photo was taken in 1948 and it's one of the earlier photos we have of her in the archives. She studied at Riverside Community College um, under the tutelage of Richard Allman. She also studied at Art Center, which was then located in Los Angeles before it moved to Pasadena. And at Art Center, she studied with Bars Miller and Edward, I'm sorry, I can't see this. Ed Edward Kaminsky. This is an early self-portrait that she did. Um, and I like to look at that image and think to myself, you know, little did she know uh, that at the time that she painted this, later in her life she would become a life fellow of uh, the American Watercolor Society and also a life member of the Royal Society of Art. This is a woman on the cusp of her career. During her college years, she happened to meet this tall guy named Rex Brin at Riverside Community College where he was teaching. Uh, he's two, he was two years her senior. Uh, he was born in San Diego, raised in Riverside, and graduated from UC Berkeley. He taught at Riverside Community College but also taught at various other institutions including USC, Scripps, the University of Vermont, and Chouinard. 
Um, in the course of his career, he wrote numerous books on watercolor style and technique, and of course was recognized as a member of the California School, the White Paper Painters, the California Scene Painters. They married in June 1938, and I have a little quote for you. Thus began a joyous relationship which proved that artists of different temperaments can merge their personal lives for more than 50 years without losing their individual artistic abilities. This is a painting by Joan that was created in 1937 called Bare Skin Neck Mass, Massachusetts that is. It's a 15 by 23 inch watercolor on paper and it was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1940. It had been placed on display in New York in a special ex exhibition called the Pacific Coast Watercolor Exhibition and she was the youngest artist at the time to have a work acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. These are examples of her work from many decades later, about 35 years later. Um, and you can see her style had changed quite a bit. Artists evolve. And so these are cover art from Orange County Illustrated. You may recognize that publication. The one on the left is from May 1972. The one on the right is from April 1971. And for those of you who may already be familiar with Joan's art and her style, you would recognize this. It's probably much more familiar looking to you than bare skin neck. Um, she was, she was one of the youngest of what was then called the adventurous and extroverted painters of the California school. And she, she was considered um, the, I'm sorry, let me see if I can move this over. My notes are all, all on this page. And so she was recognized as the genre painter of that group. Um, and she found meanings in the small but fundamental experiences of everyday life. And that's something I want you to look for as we explore her art today, those fu small but fundamental experiences of everyday life. Such as her friend Flo sitting in the corner with the light reading a book. views of goldenrod, views of El Moro, and views of the jetty in Newport. A view of China House. Views of plastic draperies on the home under construction in her neighborhood. A quote of Jones that was published in 1983 was, I love to paint rags flying in the wind. View of an ornament featuring the Balboa Pavilion and boats in Newport Harbor. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Can you go back? Sure. Mm-hmm. In the shadow? Mm hmm Do you guys see it? <laughs> do you do you all see the heart that he found? Yeah. I see it. Let me know if you find anything else. This is Prize Castle number 19, one of the Sand Castle building contests. And then when I wanted to show you, the next slide will show her sketch in her sketchbook of that very same image. So we have her sketch before she completed the painting. And then if we go back again, you'll see the finished painting.
And there's our sketch again. She loved nature. Um, and one of, her, one of her quotes was, I take comfort in the feeling that nature is greater than man. By the use of my brush, I try to identify with it. This is um, a piece called Knob Island Toward Yellow Island from 1964. And again, it's from her sketchbooks in the archives. You can see that dividing line in the center of the volume. Another quote of Jones, my flowers, like my children, are as much a part of me as my paintings. And here we have on the left some Iceland poppies. Up on the top is a piece called Bell of Portugal. And the bottom right is flyaway poppies. In the archives, there are photos and photos of jars and vases of flowers, of roses and of poppies. This is a piece called Beach Party. And again, another quote by Joan, I paint what I see and what I feel deeply about. When my children were young, I could not go far afield to look for subject matter. And so gradually, I became aware of the wealth of paintable experiences which surrounded me. My children, shadows on a terrace, a moonstruck mockingbird in the giant honeysuckle, and the ever-changing moods of the sea at the end of our street. And again, children remained a constant theme in her work. Um, some of you may or may not know that she did sculpture as well. I was speaking with a woman before the talk who um, had a great story about a sculpture of Jones. The one on the left is a sculpture of Dancing Girls from 1975. Um, the top sketch of hers is from 1941. It's the earliest piece of hers that we have in the archives of the child with the cradle. And then the lower right-hand one is a Christmas card by Joan. Yes? I wondered if they were the same ones. Yes. So the ones on the left are part of the exhibit out in the lobby. So I invite you to go take a closer look at them. And there is a photo in the archives of the inside of their house. And you see the three little sculptures on, on a shelf near what looks like the dining room table. Again, continuing with our theme of children, um, the larger piece on the left um, was actually a card for an exhibit of her work at Chalice Gallery in Laguna Beach in 1970. Uh, the piece is called Blue Bikini. And um, going back to that same 1983 article about Joan, published in American Artist Magazine, um, there was a quote, the sturdy little figure in Blue Bikini, graceful and perfectly balanced, was first, first sketched on the beach near Brant's home. You can't see something like that without thinking about it, she says. Up at the top is a piece called Balloons and Pepsis from 1980. And on the bottom is Beach Encounter from 1986. And she also sketched her loved ones in intimate moments and like every mother or every wife, when you have a little bit of solace in a quiet house and a sleeping husband or a sleeping child, um, you know you're not supposed to wake them up, but you go over and you gaze at them anyways. And so on the left is a sketch of Rex called Night Watch from 1978. And on the right is, is a sketch of her granddaughter Mimi. And what I love about the Mimi one, and if you look on the lower right hand corner, is the detail of her lips. She was sent for Christmas a teddy bear named Gladly by her eldest daughter. And Gladly became a source of inspiration and, and fun. And so there are numerous drawings and sketches and photographs in the collection of Gladly. Um, 
whom she decorated and dressed for different events. So this is one such sketch of Gladly. And eventually, she made a book. And the book was self-published in 1991, titled Gladly and His Friends. Um, and it features the antics and, and various illustrations by Joan of Gladly Norman Bear and his friend Rabbit. And this page, of course, shows them dressed for Halloween. I wanted to include this letter because we've been looking at some of her art and thinking about the types of things and the subject matter that she painted. And she was known as Joan Irving as an artist. She maintained uh, her identity with her maiden name throughout most of her career. But like all married, all, all married women, there tends to be confusion from time to time about one's name and how one should be addressed. And you'll see, in 1954, she received a letter from the American Watercolor Society addressed to a Miss M-I-S-S -S Brandt. And she'd been married to Rex for about 20 years at that point, a little longer. Anyways, but this wonderful letter acknowledges um, that she is a new artist member of the organization. And it's very serious and very formal. And the largest paragraph in the center of it has very detailed explanations about what she is to do with the special blue and white ribbon that she must wear on her lapel that accompanies her status as a member of this august institution. Bearing in mind that as a busy woman who's an artist, a mother, a wife, um, to an accomplished painter, um, she's living in a very busy household. And the fun of this is not so much the important serious letter on the, on the front, but the back, which has a note from her daughter, her second child, her younger daughter, Shelley, that says, I have gone to Mary Kay's. Love, Shelley. And in the meantime, she's got some figures where she's been writing down some accounting and some other little notes. And it's interesting that the, the, the letter is a very valid and important professional letter and then like, the realities of household life. Shelley went down the road to go play with Mary Kay. And again, as, as a very involved, a very active artist, one who cares about her community, she served as, the, as a member of the Newport City Arts Commission for 11 years, and she was, in fact, the, the founding chair of that organization. She was one of 13 founders of the Newport Harbor Art Museum, and she served as its director from 1960 to 1962. The publication that you see on the left-hand side um, is from 1987, when they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of the museum. And I thought I would ask if any of you have information to share. At that time, only five of the 13 founders were in that image. All we have in the archives is the cover. I don't have the article that tells me the names of the women. I've been able to find a list online of the women who were founding members, but as was um, Apropos, at the time, they're all listed by their husband's names. So, Mrs. Rex Brandt, Mrs. J. Stoddard. We don't have all those women's first names. So if any of you happen to know the names of a founding member, and if you are able to identify any of those women, please come and talk to me afterwards. So we need to set the historical record straight. Again, another, another facet of her civic involvement, um, she created the a tile mural for what was then the very new um, Newport Harbor View Elementary School that was built in 1953. And this is the mural that she built at that time. Yes. Which one is Joan? I didn't bring the list of the other members. Um, but again, I have a list of them, of course, by their husband's names. But I'd be happy to share the list with you, and maybe you could help me, again, flesh them out a little bit. 
So we need some community information gathering. I, I hear some chatting over here about names, yes. Okay, we're talking afterwards. <laughs> so I think that Joan has a very interesting perspective with respect to her art. And if you think about someone who was busy making lunch and busy chasing around two little girls and busy helping to manage her husband with his painting endeavors, this is someone who had to paint and needed to paint and needed to be creative and yet who also probably found herself looking out of the kitchen window a lot as she was watching dishes. And I think that a lot of her paintings show that type of view and that type of perspective. She's always looking out. And, and we're going to look at a couple together and, and just watch for that as, as we look at them. Um, this is a view uh, from her sketchbooks. Um, of Joni and Clark's garden, so her elder daughter and husband and their home up in Washington State. This is from the early 1990s. The next set of views, um, the one on the left is titled Lower Terrace Rancho Taxco from 1964. And the one on the right is again back at the Scarborough home in the early 80s. But again, she's often looking out. This one, we know she's out of doors. And I'm sorry for the quality of the, the image. Um, unfortunately, this is the best copy we had in, in the library. This is called Happiness in an, is an Empty Lot. And again, she's outside looking toward the encroaching community. This one is called California Pipe Dream, 1982. And so again, we're peering through the pipes looking at, at the ocean. But again, what does it say about progress and change um, in Southern California? This one is West Wind. And I wish I had a date for you for this one. And then I'm going to share another one of her quotes um, about, the Cal about California in particular, because I think nature is, is, again, such a dominant theme in her work. And she says, of course, there's something about California that pulls the painter towards the landscape idiom. I don't think it's beauty so much as a feeling of space. And that's especially true along the coast. I look out across the ocean, and I'm moved by a sense of space. The ocean is a touch of infinity. I like knowing that it can't be built, with, built on or changed. I like the feeling of nature being bigger than man. And I like to be able to express these things when I pick up a brush and paint. This is what I call the fence series. Um, Again, the idea of looking outside. There's always something beyond the fence or beyond the border. The one on the left is a detail um, of a painting called Pumpkins on the Fence. And then the ones on the, the right, both above and below, neither of them are titled. But when I was looking at them a little more closely, they appear to be the same place with the trees behind them, different times of years. The fence is nearly identical. Of course, she traveled. Um, and these are some images from her sketchbook of her travels. Some of you may recognize the skyline there on the left, uh, San Francisco. You can see Coit Tower. And then the one on the right is a market in Taxco from 1964. And you can see that by 1964, she's really using that white space, even in her sketchbook, to define um, the canopies uh, in the market. This is also from her sketchbooks, and this is the Sacramento River in 1972.
So Rex and Joan purchased two properties in Corona del Mar uh, shortly after they were married. This view is from um, Plat Maps for Newport Beach and Costa Mesa, which was published in 1961. And the image is courtesy of the Sherman Library. Um, and it shows Goldenrod Street. You can see the big, wide um, block in the center. That's Goldenrod. And the property that the Brants lived on was to, just to the right. And then you can see the Goldenrod footbridge in the center, and that's Bayside Drive. On the left, I've inserted two little documents from the Newport Beach City records, um, which if you haven't found it, there's this wonderful online searchable database of council resolutions. And so if you care about property history, it's a great, great source. Um, but those documents from the city records show that the Brants purchased one parts parcel in Corona del Mar in February of 1941 for $250. And then, in 1943, in June of that year, they went ahead and splurged and bought another one for $150. Which box did they do? Uh, um, just to the right of the footbridge. Um, the numbers are a little bit blurry, but it looks like 316-ish from here. 316, 314. Mm -hmm. And on that property, they built their home. Well, home, studio, workshop, um, called Blue Sky. And this is the only piece in tonight's talk that is not by Joan. It is by her husband, Rex. And this is from Rex's sketchbooks. And this is his, his drawing of Blue Sky from 1966. And um, you, I presume most of you, if you're local, you're familiar with the, the marker that was placed two years ago by the City Arts Commission right at the, the entrance to the footbridge that uh, commemorates uh, Blue Sky as a, as a cultural site here in the city. But it was their home, it was their school, it was their studio, and it was always evolving and always changing. And so Joan had lots of corners and places to paint. Um, and a lot of people, I think, are interested in, in how Joan and Rex operated together as two artists who were fundamentally working alongside each other and yet had their separate worlds and had very distinct and different styles. Um, and in that interview from July 1983, um, Joan describes that. I think it was always of interest to so many people. Um, there's, there's a section of the, t of the interview where, she, where they first describe Blue Sky, and then they describe the two of them working. They have always loved the sea, they, meaning the Brants, swimming and sailing. They brought property at Corona del Mar and built a rambling house they named Blue Skies. They made additions as needed to accommodate a growing family with separate studios for an expanding workload as the demand for their pictures increased. To be married to a man as famous, talented, and personable as Rex Brandt offers a constant challenge. Irving, unassuming, and a self-styled tomboy has proved a marvel at juggling the obligations of home, children, Brandt's career, and her own active life as a practicing artist, but as she is also a woman with independent ideas. I hope I am not too influenced by Rex's work, says Irving. I must paint in complete isolation. Rex is analytical. I'm more personal. I'm a sporadic painter, compulsive, exclamation point. I have to be excited about a subject before I even start a painting. This is June 1961 of The New Porter. Um, and the headline is, The Brant School Opens, The Time Has Come for Painting in Newport. And so the Brants opened up their home every summer um, to teach um, aspiring and established artists for the Brant Painting Workshops. Uh, those workshops were initially created with fellow painter Phil Dyke in the, in in the early 1940s. 
Um, and eventually, as Phil Dyke moved on to other things, Joan took on an even larger role, and she was co-director of the Brandt Painting Workshop um, from 1946 till 1985. These are a couple pages from a photo album created by a few of their students. Uh, the photo album was created in 1982, and this shows you a few views of, of the workshop and what it looked like. Um, there's Joan, of course, on the left, holding the microphone, Rex behind her. You can see the works on the shelf behind. On the right, I think this is incredibly funny, the tag says, in case Joan can't save it, dot, 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 and there she is giving instruction or help to someone. Notice the ambulance parked on the street behind them. Now, I don't think they really would have had an ambulance there to help someone with their art, um, but it's certainly a funny caption that in case Joan can't save it, there's an ambulance to help them out. And then, of course, you can see a, a cluster of, of eager learners down below. They also took students on study trips. And one of their biggest trips was the 1965 tour of Europe. And Joan is in the front row, um, just above the capital T of Brandt, so the third person over um, from the left. And of course, Rex is that front row, um, large man just to the left in the front. During this particular trip, Rex filled four sketchbooks with drawings, photographs, things pasted in. Um, Joan filled two. But her sketchbooks also have all the financial details of the trip and their contact information for who, th who they've been working with and what things cost. And these are a few examples of their trip. Um, this is Joan's sketchbook, uh, The Castle at Tancorville. These are views of the marina at Sorrento, Italy. And this is really fun. This is one of the great things about archives and why librarians like me get so excited. In her sketchbook is a photograph of her view from the balcony from her hotel. To the left is her drawing in the sketchbook of that view of the balcony from the hotel. The large image to the right is her final finished painting that she did after she came home. And so again, we can see her process and we can see the things that she chose to change, the things she kept, how the palette and the colors changed in that final work. And here I've overlaid two sketchbooks, one which is Rex's and one which is Joan's, just to show you that their two works juxtaposed um, against each other. Because again, they're traveling together. Um, this is Manarola. And Rex is the larger image, uh, most of which you see to the right. Jones is the work to the left. And again, you can see their palettes are different, their style is different. And then this is St. Mark's in Venice. Rex is on the left, and then overlaid is Jones. Similar but different. And so in 2011, um, the daughters of Rex and Joan Brandt uh, contacted us at the library at the Laguna College of Art and Design in Laguna Beach. And Rex had been a faculty member, an early faculty member for the college. He taught for us our very first year that we had classes in 1962, and then served on the board in the 70s for the school. And they were looking for a good home for the archives. And they really liked the idea that the the papers of Rex and Joan could help benefit other students and other aspiring artists. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of background about the school and um, the type of work that our students do. Of course, we do plein air painting. Of course, we do watercolor. You see one of our watercolor classes there in the lower right-hand corner. Um, we were founded in 1961. And as I said earlier, our first classes were offered in 1962. And it's still very much a, a traditional figurative school. We have fine art, drawing and painting, illustration. But we also offer degrees in animation, game art, 
um, and design and digital media. There's a strong sculpture program at the school. They've recently introduced a creative writing minor. And we're now at about 500 students, so we've grown quite a bit from our early years as a small community education program. And we grant both BFA and MFA degrees. The collection that they gave us features 80 sketchbooks created by Rex and Joan um, over six decades. So it's a really marvelous collection that shows their growth and development as artists. And when we're talking to artists who are in their early 20s, um, for them to, to become aware of this body of work and see it and be inspired um, is, is really exciting. And I can't tell you how many times we're trying not to eavesdrop in the library, but we hear them saying, oh, look at that one. Oh, my goodness. How did he do that? How did she do that? So in, on our campus, they, they've achieved some certain amount of rock star status. So I included this image to the left by one of our, our students who is actually an employee in the library, um, a soon-to-be graduating senior uh, named Aiden. And I thought it's a very good uh, example of where the young artist wants to be and, and you know, the young artist climbing up, trying to ascend the world of, of art. And I think Rex and Joan appreciate that and know, know what that struggle is and would appreciate the fact that the students are, are looking to them for guidance. And so the students want to see things like her palette, what color choices are, are she making, is she making? How is she experimenting with wet on wet? Um, where is she painting when she's painting on site? This image to the right is of her painting in Taos in 1970. So knowing what colors they're using, what time of year she's in Taos, um, that's all important in our understanding the history and the legacy and the decision making behind some of those paintings of hers. And so again, all students keep sketchbooks. And they know what it means to keep a sketchbook, to have something intimate, to have something that you're experimenting with. They don't think about them, though, as something that someone else will look to later in the future. And we use the Brandt sketchbooks as a teaching tool in that regard. And um, every year, I meet with watercolor classes and the study abroad group. And we talk about making sketchbooks and keeping sketchbooks and documenting your work and not throwing them out later on when you're embarrassed by what you did five or 10 or 20 years ago. There's a reason why we want these kept. This is a photo of the brands from later in their lives and you can see lined up behind them on that lower shelf, those are some of their sketchbooks. And their substantial volumes are about eight by 10 in size. They were custom made for them with watercolor paper. And so we like to think that it, at the college, um, that the brands are part of our teaching faculty still. And, and it's through their works and through their, their legacy, through their art, um, that we can inspire new artists and continue their stories. So I'm going to leave you with a, a, a parting quote of Jones. And um, I'm also going to tell you that yesterday afternoon at the college, we celebrated her birthday with cake. And we're in the middle of midterms. So many students were very happy to have a good, you know, forkful of sugar. Um, but many of our students did not know who she was. And so one of our goals is to make sure that more people talk about Joan Irving, talk about her art, and her great contributions. So my, my challenge to you all um, is in the next few weeks, make sure you mention Joan, make sure you mention the exhibit here at the library. Come and see us down the road at Laguna College of Art and Design where you can see some of her things as well. And let's make sure we keep her legacy alive by sharing her art and, and telling people about her great work. So we'll end with her words because they're much better than mine. Um, and this is something she said in February of 1949 when she was a very young artist. And so she said, first, painting serves to make me cherish what leisure moments I can secure from my daily chores. Second, I like to be out of doors. 
Third, painting involves close observation to help eliminate unessential detail and still retain the true character of the subject matter. This study leads to the development of a sense of awareness of the people and things around us, which we usually take for granted. Awareness of people and things is an art which is self-rewarding in that it leads one to appreciate without desiring. So thank you for coming tonight. Do we have any questions, or do I have any people who have names of those women from that, that image? Yes. Um, do you have pieces of uh, either Joan or Rex on display at the school all the time, somewhere? Mm -hmm. not, it's not on display all the time, um, but actually we, we have been putting together a small exhibit for Joan's centennial as well. Um, next week is spring break, and those final... Those final pieces will be done. My colleague Krista, who's here, has done a fantastic job with arranging gladly and other beautiful things just so. Um, so yes, I would say if you swing by the campus sometime after next week, we should have it all the bows tied and the eyes dotted because we had a nice show for Rex and we want to acknowledge hers as well. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, we've, we have most recently shown student work. So our, our exhibit for the fall semester and the first part of the semester were some wonderful handmade books that students were making. But we're planning on having a little show related to Joan up through the summer. So do come by in the next few months and take a look. And we'd be delighted to take other things out from the collection to share them with you. So um, I did bring some of my cards. So if you want to call and let me know you're coming, we know we can pull out additional items too. Yes. There are some. Um, they tend to be more calendars, so as opposed to uh, a, a more diary narrative type of thing. So we know about appointments or who they had lunch with, and those tended to be more Rex rather than Joan. And, and especially in, in his later years, he was, I think, more meticulous about keeping a calendar. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question. Yes. About the children's books. Something Gladly. That they actually had published as a children that's still in print? Or? From what we can tell from the archives, it was a self-published spiral-bound book. But there is material that indicates that they were giving it away and quite possibly selling it. So we have a completed copy of it, as well as the manuscript versions and the, some of the original artwork for it. Um, from what I can tell, I don't believe there was a larger commercial publishing house um, that issued it. But again, if you're welcome to come and read the book. because glad. And in fact, I think Gladly is on exhibit here in the library as well. I think it's in one of the cases. But she has wonderful photos of them dressed up and posed. And then you can see her sketches of them too. So I think it brought them a lot of um, joy and, and a lot of whimsy into their days. Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with her, but I'm getting that the um, classes they have in their home evolved into the school. Is that correct? Well, they called it a school, but it was essentially a, a, a series of classes that were held at their home in summer for artists. So they called it the Brandt School of Painting. It had actually went through about four or five different names, but most often it's called the Brandt Summer School or the Brandt School of Painting. So it wasn't, it wasn't a degree-granting institution. It was more like a series of workshops that they had put together for artists to come. Um, and they would work out of their home, but then they would have spaces uh, generally around the area in Corona Del Mar and Newport where they would go and paint in situ at different locations. And the students had different lessons. And then he taught, yes, he taught um, dedicated classes at the college in its early years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone can come and see them, but they're not sitting on the public shelves. They're actually in an area that we call special collections because they are rare and one of a kind. But whenever anyone comes in and asks about them, 
we set you up at the table. We do ask that you use the white cotton gloves, which is very exciting for our students. They love the white gloves. And so you can come and look at them and just turn page after page and, and enjoy them. So we want, we want people to see them and use them. We don't necessarily want them locked away, but for their own safety, we have to have them um, locked up during the day, but we're happy to pull them out. At the college library. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, if you know any of those women in the photo, come and talk to me. Thank you. Before we leave, I'd like to make a special announcement. I'd like to thank Gordon McClellan, and I'd like to thank Jennifer Wormser, first of all, for this beautiful presentation this evening. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd also like to let you know that the exhibition was curated by author and historian Gordon McClelland, and that the collectors who so generously offered their works to be exhibited are uh, Jan and Mark Hilbert. There's the Hilbert Museum of California Scene Painting now at Chapman University. Jean and Diane Crane, uh, their works are out there. Um, the Brandt family offered their works to be used as well. The beautiful pumpkin sculpture that you see in the case is there, and the tiny sculptures that Jennifer uh, mentioned in her presentation are out there, Jeff Olson and Gordon McClellan himself. Before you leave this evening, I'd like to um, mention something that I hope you'll participate in the Newport Beach Arts Foundation and that you will join. This program this evening and our other arts programs, our concerts on the green, um, our exhibits in the lobby, our Newport Beach Sculpture Garden on the Civic Center, and most everything that we do is generously supported by the City Council and the Newport Beach Arts Foundation. In order for our programming to continue, we need more to participation in the community and hope that many more people in our Newport Beach community will join the Newport Beach Arts Foundation. And we have members of the Newport Beach Arts Foundation. The chair, I believe, is in the audience this evening, or the president, Carmen Smith. Carmen, can you stand up? Carmen Smith, the president of the Newport Beach Arts Foundation. And board member, Pat Jorgensen. Pat, can you stand up, take a bow? They volunteer and help us throughout the year in everything that we do. We have the Newport Beach Arts Exhibition coming up. That's our next event. So I hope you'll join the Newport Beach Arts Foundation. It's not terribly expensive. There are papers in the back of the room, and they'll help you with that. If you'd like to take it home, fill it out, and bring it back, that would be great. Most of all, I'd like to thank you. You're the unsung heroes who support the arts. And I thank you for coming to this evening and joining us for this special presentation. Thank you. Good night.